Take your Bibles to Isaiah 52 and stand with me if you would, Isaiah chapter 52. I know you just said, I'm sorry. Isaiah 52 and stand for the reading of the only book God ever wrote. I'd say that's something to stand for. Tremendous music. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan. Thank you, choir, orchestra. Thank you, Jessica, for, for singing and playing that. What that was was an act of worship. Bless the Lord. We'll be looking at Isaiah 52, and we'll be looking at verse number 13 and following. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished or astonished that his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider." It makes it sound like there's going to be a day when the politics all comes to an end. Mm, it will not even vote. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And if you are wondering who the arm that has been revealed in verse 1 is, well, he's the one that grew up as a tender plant before the Lord in verse 2, and he's the one in verse 3 who is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Isn't that something? Here in a few short weeks, Pastor Sean will be preaching from this chapter, and so I won't mention much from the chapter as a whole, but I did want you to notice how we are the sheep in verse 6, and he became a lamb in verse 7. That sounds rather Christmassy, doesn't it? How he became one of us. Brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And there's a king I can be happy about. Boy, I'm thinking of all kinds of crazy things to say. Let's move forward. Verse 10. <laughs> Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise the one who became a lamb. It pleased the Lord to bruise the one that was despised. It pleased the Lord to bruise the one that grew up before him as a tender plant. It pleased the Lord to bruise his own arm. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. Well, there is a resurrection proof. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. 
Master, breathe through this passage for your people. You've promised to bless your word. You've pl promised to bless your people. You've promised to bless preaching. You've promised to bless your preacher. You've promised to bless your day. And so we can't lose this morning. Bless this preaching of your word. Get full glory out of it. And give us a foretaste of what it will be like to stand in your presence with Father and Son. And we will thank you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Today I want to talk to you about raising a perfect son. Raising a perfect son. You know, there are several aspects that we can talk about when it comes to God raising Christ. Let me tell you about some things I'm not going to talk about much this morning. Number one, God raising Christ on a cross. Did you know it was Jesus who raised, it was God the Father who raised Jesus' as son on the cross? We can blame Judas and we can blame the Jews and we can blame the Gentiles who would have killed them had they been there. We can blame uh, the centurion and we can blame the Romans and we can blame everybody. But God said in Matthew 26, smite the shepherd, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. When Jesus, it says, spoke of his glorification, he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. And it says in chapter 12, verse 33 of John, by this he spoke which signifying, signifying which death he should die. Christ said that it was the Father who would raise up Jesus on the cross. Blame God for the crucifixion. Blame God for killing his son on our behalf. I have a dear grandfather that I hope comes to faith in Christ. I pray comes to faith in Christ. I love him dearly. He'll be 92 in April. My sister witnessed to him on the phone the other day and begged him to believe on the gospel. And he said, I will try. And I remember thinking about how feeble it was the day that I tried to believe. I remember how I wanted to be saved. I wanted the way of salvation to be very clear, but it wasn't. My mind was darkened, and even if I were aware of how to be saved, I didn't have the faith to believe on the cross, who was, on the Christ who was risen on a cross, raised on a cross. But that's not what we're going to talk about today necessarily. Number two, I'm not going to talk necessarily about God raising his perfect son from the grave, although he certainly did do that. Today we can go to the Holy Land and find seven or eight tombs, I'm sure they say belong to him. And they're guessing as much as the people who say they found the ossuary of Jesus' family. It's all ridiculous to say that you can find the body of someone who rose from the dead. It's so ridiculous. It's so silly. You're looking for it. It's, it's not going to be there. Christ is risen indeed. And the reason that we worship on Sundays is not because it's too early for the football game to start, because God knows some of you are thinking about that. The reason we worship on Sunday is because Jesus made it a very, very well-known day by vacating a borrowed tomb. It was okay for him to borrow the tomb. He only needed it for the weekend. Yes, only needed it for the weekend. Well, from the womb to the tomb, Jesus was always short-timing. And so we're glad that God raised him from the tomb. If you wear him on a cross, on a crucifix, for anything outside of a family heirloom, you're missing the point. The cross is empty as much as the grave. Number three, I won't be necessarily speaking about God raising his perfect son to his throne on high. Although 1 Peter 3 says that when Christ was crucified, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being justified, put to death in the flesh, but raised in the spirit, it says that after that, he was exalted far above all principalities and powers, making them subject to him. Yeah, Colossians 2 says he spoiled them and is vacating the land of the dead. The devil doesn't even have the keys to his own house this morning. Christ knocked him in the mouth and took the keys. We're in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. 
how sorry it is to own a place and not even have the keys. But he is sorry after all. Can't wait till Revelation 20.10 begins and that devil which deceives the nations is cast alive into a burning fire, which, a burning lake with bur which burns with fire where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Won't be long. <laughs> Won't be long. Mm. Well, praise God. Number four. I won't be talking necessarily about this because really all of these were spoken of in that special, weren't they? God raising his perfect son in the hearts of the believer. Malachi chapter 4 says, Unto you, unto you that look for him, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Now think about that. The son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Luke 1 calls him the day spring. 2 Peter chapter number 1 says, We have this day star which has arisen in our hearts. Yesterday we were doing something crazy. We were driving before the sun came up. We were heading east, which is a good direction to go if you want to see the sunrise. And uh, you think I'm joking. I know a man in college that was going to treat his uh, girlfriend to a sunset, and we lived in Virginia Beach. All right, take that in there for a moment. Turn your back on the water and look back over towards the car to see your sunset. Oh, well, he tried. Yeah. That first gleam where you don't yet see the sun. By the way, day star is, is Venus in 2 Peter 1. I'm not saying Jesus and Venus are the same. It's just a picture. Don't blog about it. That first glimpse of the light over the horizon that is not yet the sun is, in fact, the day spring, the first light. And all those things are true. We would agree that God raised Jesus onto a cross. We would agree that God raised Jesus from the dead. We would agree that God raised his son to his own right hand. We would agree that God raised his son in the heart of the believer today. We would agree with that. I hope you didn't come for some sort of post-Christmas depression lift. If you know Jesus, his day spring is in your heart and you just get over family going home because the king of kings still lives in your house. Yeah, I don't care that eggnog's not being sold anymore, and that is something to cry about, that eggnog is not being sold anymore. And thank God the fruitcakes are out of season. But I do want to say that when all the bad things are in your mind, you don't need therapy. You need to push the depression out of your mind and bless the Lord that even though the shepherds have gone home and the wise men have gone home, the King of Kings is still risen in our hearts. Yeah. The reason you get up on December 30th and go to work with joy in your heart is because Jesus isn't a baby anymore. He got up from the dead. He got up from the grave. He got up from the cross. He got up from, and he is alive forevermore and has the keys of death and hell. And soon we'll cut that eastern sky and we'll be together forever when his throne comes to earth and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Bless the Lord. Now then, draw your attention back to verse number two of our text. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Consider, first of all, this crazy, profound idea of Christ growing up. Christ growing up. What do we mean by that? Do we mean he had growing pains? Do we mean that he had clumsiness? Do we mean that he had headaches that kept him up at night? Do you think he had acne? What about body odor? How about itchy feet? Do you think that he had to shower? Do you think that being born of a virgin, being the God-man means that he did not experience humanity? No, indeed, when he tripped, he skinned his knee. Think about that. Think about Jesus having a bedtime. Think about Jesus going to school. I've heard well-meaning people say that Jesus would go to biology class and teach it. But that's not what Scripture says. 
I would like to draw your attention. Please keep your place here. And we're going to go to one other place this morning. Look, please, at Luke chapter number 2. Keep your place here and look at Luke chapter number 2. Consider the tenderness with which Christ grew up before the Lord God as a tender plant. You know, sometimes people accuse Mr. Spurgeon of being a Calvinist because he preached some sermons that were so Calvin heavy, it didn't sound like anyone could get saved. And sometimes people would accuse him of being so Armenian because he wouldn't mention anything about election in a sermon. And he would preach that whosoever will may come. Yeah, that's right. You heard me say it right. Well, sometimes we preach Christ so godlike we forget his humanity. And sometimes we preach him so human like we forget his godhood. So I'm afraid that I won't satisfy every question you have this morning. But maybe I've done something no preacher has ever been able to do, and that has caused you to wonder anything when you leave church. Amen. Luke chapter 2, I'd like to draw your attention to verse number 40. And by the way, I'm just another preacher. Verse number 40 of Luke chapter number 2. And the child grew. Who are we talking about? Verse 39. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, and the child, Jesus, grew. Child grew. And waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now please look at verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, would you please look at that word grace in verse 40 of your King James Bible, if you have that this morning. Look at the word grace in verse 40, and look at the word favor in verse 52. Guess what? They're the same Greek word. Well, I wonder how it, I wonder how it messes with you to say that Jesus grew in grace. That's, if, I, if I didn't see it on the pages of my Bible, I wouldn't say it. But Jesus grew in grace. Now, before we go anywhere, I want you to take a gander at chapter 3 and verse 4. I want you to see, we're not going to read much of this passage. In fact, just the first line. As it is written in the book of the words, Isaiah, that's the, uh, probably, who in here has a, a Bible that says Isaiah? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, okay, good. All right. Yeah, it's Isaiah. Isaiah is the English version, the English translation of the Greek word for Isaiah. Okay, it's Isaiah. As it is written in the book of the words, Isaiah the prophet. You can see Luke is thinking a lot about Isaiah. All right, look at chapter 4. He gives a story, and of course, when I say story, I don't mean make-believe. Look at verse 17. And there was delivered unto, the book, unto him, unto Jesus, the book of the prophet, say it with me, Isaiah or Isaiah, right? So twice in two chapters and probably more, uh, Luke is alluding to, or you could say he is, he is quoting Isaiah. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that in chapter 2, Luke, when he records these words, verse 40 through 52, I don't think it's a stretch for him to be thinking about Isaiah 53, verse 2. Let's look at it again. Chapter 2, verse 40 of Luke. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And he says it again in verse 52. So what I want to know is, are these bookends, are you going to teach us something in between, Luke? Please, look at verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old... They went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. Now that must have been quite a crowd. If you cannot notice that your 12-year-old is missing for a couple of days. Verse 46, and it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. 
And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto me, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? A typical thing that a 12-year-old Jewish boy would say. I'm actually not joking. At 12 years old, a young man would go through a ceremony. Many of you know about it. And at that time, at 12 years old, he was no longer allowed to hang around with mom in the kitchen. He followed dad to the workshop. He was about his father's business. But now, alas, he does not follow the carpenter. In verse 49, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he, went, which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, his, his, his parents. He was subject to them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. That's the second time we find that in this chapter. In verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Does this mean that God, that... Well, he grew in wisdom. Think about that. that that's, uh, that's really something. Does this mean that Christ was ever foolish? Well, of course not. No, rather it means that his mental capacity grew and his wisdom grew with his mental capacity. Now that might be hard for you to swallow because you might have been looking at art uh, for the whole of your life with halos around people. But the fact is we have Jesus who grew up on really the wrong side of the tracks. And he grew in wisdom, then spiritual strength. Verse 40 says, filled with wisdom and the grace of God, he found wisdom and spiritual strength, awareness, attitude, drive, inner push. His prime mover was being developed. His innate God, listen to this, this is going to upset some of you. His innate God consciousness. His pleasure for God, his pleasure for his father. He grew in this, he developed in this. And yet the God man did this? Think about it. Does this mean that he thought Joseph was his father previously? I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't know. Does this mean that he assumed himself a carpenter's apprentice until now? No, I don't know. We find in verse 50, and please don't fix me after the service. Look at verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And so he grew in his maturity, in his sobriety, in his ability to converse. The young people today don't know that word. They say conversate. He grew in his ability to hold good conversations. If he were living today, he wouldn't be doing this all the time. He would actually look at people in the eyeballs when he talks to them. He would actually give a good firm handshake because dad taught him how to do that. His acceptability, his benefit, his pleasure, it grew. It was about character development, social interaction, work ethic, commitment and fulfillment and commitment fulfillment. That is how the Christ of God grew up before Yes, Joseph the carpenter would be before his father as a tender plant. Man, I'm bald and those lamps are hot. I feel like a french fry. I trust it's not as hot out there. You children are doing a great job. Doing a great job. Now, how did God see Christ? Look at chapter 3 and verse 22. Look at that verse with me as Christ is... Concluding the baptism, look in verse 22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon Christ. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son. Look at this next phrase. In whom I am well pleased. Now think through this with me for just a moment. Three years later... He's on the Mount of Transfiguration, maybe two years later, maybe two and a half years later. And God says the very same thing in Matthew 17. This is my son. I'm well pleased with him. Listen to him. He says it here. He says it here. And scripturally, all we have to look back upon, according to Luke, is verses 40 and 52, where it says he grew. So how was he between, what, two when the wise men came and saw him? I don't know. And 12 and 12 and 30 when he was baptized? How was he? Oh, he was pleasing to the Father. Mm, think about that. Around the holidays, he never said anything, he never said anything cutting about someone else. Uh, hello, 
He never let social media be the reason why he could say something cutting about someone. He was never crushing someone with his words. He was always, it says, he was subject to his parents. He was always respecting mom and dad. I mean, are you listening to me? I mean, his closing act was taking care of mom before he dies. Honoring mom at the age of 33. Some of, some of, you, some of you need a few moments with mom and dad. You think when you're 18, that means since you have a legal right to move out, you can now dishonor your parents. You still need a whipping. Yes, sirree. Aren't we having fun? What are some points of application? If we can see that God takes pleasure in the growth of his son, then I think that, listen, fathers and, and mothers, we should take pleasure in the growth of our children. I mean, we should really enjoy it when they take an interest in something. Now, it might be my dream that Junior here, my dear son, Jacob David, it might be my choosing that one day he grows up to want to be a pastor as much as I do. But guess what? I'd rather him love Jesus and do what God wants him to do more than what Daddy wants him to do. As a matter of fact, I think the churches are full of young men that just couldn't hold a job down. And they decided the pastor, it looked good to them. Uh, yeah, have you ever been on vacation and visited a church? I'm not saying they're all rotten to the core, but it's tough to find a preacher sometimes on Sundays. Amen. We're both right, Jeff. Amen. <laughs> Next point of application. I think that when we take pleasure in our children, I also think that we should enjoy being enjoyed by the Father. Have you ever stopped doing to please God? I, the way, let me say that again. Have you ever stopped doing in order to be accepted by your Father? He, he's not going to love you any more than he already does. Let me say that again. Your Father in heaven is not going to love you more than he already does. He's already made the ultimate blood price. He's already made the ultimate love offering. What more can he do? He already is crazy about you. Zephaniah chapter 3 says he sings over you. I want to hear God sing. Well, you're just going to have to believe Zephaniah until you get to heaven, and then you can say, God, let me hear you blow. Let me hear you sing, God. So let me sing about the people I am thrilled about today. When's the last time you just sat in the presence of God? I'm talking about you didn't turn on the TV, you didn't pull out your Our Daily Bread, you didn't go through your prayer list, you just sat in the presence of God and grew up before him as a tender plant. I'm talking about just enjoyed being enjoyed. I mean, God paid the ultimate price. When's the last time you just got up, turned on the coffee machine, let the dogs out, and sit down and let God love you? That's good preaching. Yeah. Hey, man. And some of you are way behind because you don't have a dog or coffee. I guess you don't have to have either one of those to be loved by God, but it makes you feel like it. Some of you cat lovers. Number three. <laughs> Whew, making friends. All of this God enjoyed. Think about it. His son is growing up before him, and God loves his boy. Now, I don't want to get um, irreverent here. I surely don't. I surely don't. But think about how thrilled you are when you see your son or your daughter take their first, uh, their first uh, uh, turn at a bicycle without the training wheels. Doesn't that make you happy? When you see your first daughter, when you see your daughter make her first dessert, doesn't that make you happy? Bless the Lord. Yes, amen. And just run an extra 30 seconds on the treadmill and get over it and enjoy your piece of pie or your cookie or your cookies. Just enjoy it. Doesn't it just make you happy to see? Well, guess what? It made God the Father happy when Jesus made his first table. It made God the Father happy when Jesus would recite the Torah. It made God the Father happy when Jesus played his first game of stickball in Nazareth. It made God the Father happy when Jesus performed his first miracle. It made God the Father happy when Jesus would go up into the mountain and sit under a tree and talk to his daddy. It made God the Father very, very, very happy. Take pleasure in God's pleasure of his son. You and I are God's gift to Jesus this morning. 
It says in John 17, verse 1, the Son said to the Father, in verse 2 rather, you've given me authority to give life to all that you've given me. Take joy if you're one of God's this morning. You're a gift to the Son. Think about that, will you? You are a product of a love relationship between a father and a son. Oh, there are days when I look up and wish that I was a better father. There are days when I look up and wish I was a better son. There were days when I look around and wish I was a better grandson. Oh, but when you're falling short, you take a look at the Godhead and take pleasure in the pleasure that the Father has for the Son. Isn't that good? Mm. So I think we should enjoy being enjoyed and enjoy the Father and join the Son this morning. Yes, amen. And let everyone else don their gay apparel. <laughs> I'll catch up to some of you over lunch. That's actually a line in a Christmas carol, if you can believe it. I know you can. All right. So anyway, consider Christ, secondly, growing up and pleasing God. Now, I think that this is, uh, this is key. I think this is key. You'll notice the phrase of the verse I'm talking about. Interesting enough, I have this program on my, uh, on my computer Oh, I have a couple of them. <laughs> but I have this one. This is known as E-Sword. Now, you don't have to necessarily see, but look all the yellow. Yellow, yellow. Okay, some of you call it gold, <clears throat> especially if you have a sports team with those colors. God help it. Amen. Yep, amen. All right, so anyway, over here you might notice that the word is translated face. Just the two chapters earlier. What, what word? What word? Before him. Look at chapter 53, verse 2. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Before him comes from a Hebrew word that is also translated in someone's face. In my face. Wasn't that interesting? Let's read that back in Isaiah 53, too. It is a translation after all. You're back in Isaiah 53. He shall grow up before the face of God as a tender plant plant. Now, I want to bring to your attention the reason Isaiah is using this phrase. Now, I get it. The Holy Spirit is driving him to write this, but there's also a man God is using here. And why is Isaiah writing this? Because 51 or 52 chapters earlier, here's what Isaiah says about the people of Israel. Here's what God says to them. When you come to appear before me, that's the first time it's used in the entire book. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand? To tread my courts. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It's iniquity, even the solemn meeting. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear because your hands are full of blood. God says to the nation of Israel, you folks are so religious. You're so religious. You put signs out in your yard saying, keep Christ in Christmas. Oh, you're so religious. You have Jesus is the reason on your bumper sticker. You're so religious, but all oh, your hands are full of blood. So I would prefer that you not actually come before me and get in my face with your worship. Isn't that interesting? Now, Israel was a religious nation. A religious nation that God said could always repent. And you know, we're in a religious nation, mm, especially around the holidays. Uh, our divorce rate says that we're not that religious. Now, I'm not saying if you're divorced in here, that means it's your fault and everything. I'm not interested in that conversation this morning. I'm saying that when you have as high of a divorce rate in the church as you do outside of the church, we have, we have to talk. Uh, we're a religious nation, but our consumer debt per household rate says we're not as religious as we think we are. Are you, are you listening? When Jimmy gets a wagon, a, a shotgun, you know, a new pair of glasses, uh, Oakleys, a, a pair of boots, and gay apparel, when all that stuff happens and it's put on the credit card, we've got a problem. Now, you enjoy the goodness of God in the land of the living and buy what, what Johnny and Ethel need. We keep going back to them this morning. But the fact is, our, our churches, the reason we are not as generous as we would like to be with one another is because, well, maybe not you as an individual, but we as a, as a society are full up to our ears with debt. And then we come before God and say, God, be pleased with my lifestyle. I haven't said no all week to anybody, to include myself. I even put lattes on credit cards. Oh, dear God, be pleased with my worship.
Our apathy about our government says that we're not as religious as we think we are. We kind of make a good Israel. And when I say we, I mean America. I love you as the flock of God, but we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Oh, how they love to say Jesus when we get bombed. Oh, how they love to say God bless America when someone flies into our buildings. But where are they? Where are the believers? Where are the people that say we're a Christian nation? God help us. Sometimes I think that it would be wise to take God and, tr and God we trust off the money. At least we wouldn't have so many liars in the country. But not Jesus. Isaiah 53, 2 says he'll grow up before him as a tender plant. He'll grow up before him. He will grow up in the pleasure of God. He'll grow up in the face of God. And in other words, when, when it says that God, Christ, grew up before him as a tender plant, in other words, it was saying that God pleased, God was pleased with his son. And we've talked about that. But Jesus did not ever have dirty hands. Everything Jesus did, John 8, 39, pleased the Father. Never taking part in an activity without first seeking the Father. Father's approval. Never putting anything on without saying, God, are you okay with this? Never taking part in a conversation without saying, Father, are you okay with what I'm about to do? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? A tender plant. Thirdly, and lastly, consider Christ highly protected. Growing up, pleasing God, and highly protected. He grew up before him as a tender plant. The irony, folks, in this passage is that he grows up before him as a tender plant. What do you do with tender plants? Well, here's what I did with tender plants. I mowed over them. <laughs> now it took a couple smacks on the back of the head for me to realize I shouldn't do that. My dad loved trees, particular oak trees. And in Wisconsin, you can find oak trees in your yard about as frequently as you find dandelions. How do you mow around them all? Well, figure it out. I mowed over an oak tree one time and dad said, you mowed over an oak tree. Well, Dad, you know, we have, you mowed over an oak tree. He took one of them things that you put around it to keep the rabbits from eating it and the sons from mowing over it, and he stuck it around that thing. And I'm talking about every summer night, my dad would go out there and water that tender plant. Isn't it interesting that Isaiah 53, 2, it doesn't say he grew up in the face of God as a mighty oak. No, it doesn't say that. How about the Lebanons? How about the cedars of Lebanon? Hey, I mean, those were pretty numerous. Those were the trees. Those were the general Shermans. I mean, if after all, if I was going to describe the Son of God, I would say he'll grow up before him like a mighty cedar. But he didn't. He grew up before him as a tender plant, making sure that Christ was always protected. Don't you see that when Christ bled in the garden, who was it that came and ministered to him but angels? God is looking after his boy. When Jesus was being arrested, what did he say he could do? He could call 12 legions of angels. What was it that happened when Jesus made it through those three temptations in the wilderness? Angels came and ministered to him. Oh, how God looked after his son and protected his son and so that he could bruise him. So that he could bruise him. He got him ready for the day when he was going to whip his son and raise him on a tree. That is how much he loves you. That is how much he loves me. Take every sin that you are disgusted with this morning and throw it on Calvary and see Christ whipped for your sin. See every sin that the society has said is not a sin anymore and see it as crushing the very Son of God. See that sin that is now called choice and see that it is a sin that crushed God as he crushed his son. See that sin called orientation. See it as a sin that crushed the son. Take that sin that is now called habit and call it a sin that crushed the son. See that sin that we call temper and, and blight and a mistake and a shortcoming, and call it a sin, because Christ was bruised for that sin. Oh, how we offer hope to a world when we call their sin, sin. All you offer them is treatment when you call it something else. Now, I'm not trying to get you to take every little mood and call it a sin. I'm not trying to get you to take every little thing that happens to you and call it your sin. But I am saying that if there's anything that we have a problem with, it's downgrading our unrighteousness to something less God-demeaning, 
so that we somehow seem more clean in the eyes of others when Christ was the ultimate garbage dump for our sin. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh, I've seen some garbage dumps in my day. There's one down in some downtown that about turns every hair I ever thought about having loose. And I mean to tell you, when I think about a garbage dump, there are some places on that I-40 I don't want to drive through because of the stench. But oh, the stench on Calvary that day when God took your sin, my sin, everyone's sin, and threw it on his Jesus, the tender plant growing him up tenderly so that one day on Golgotha he could be nailed to a mighty oak and crushed for our sins. Well, from time to time I work out. And the other day I was at a fitness center in Clarksville, Tennessee. And uh, I was sitting in the sauna because I wasn't feeling well and I heard that one day, you know, if you sweat enough you might feel better. It didn't work. I got wet, all right? That's all that happened. So I sat in that sauna, and I thought, boy, this is just about overbearing. I just about can't handle this. And you know what brought me some comfort that it made me just stick it out a little bit longer? Was knowing that I could just open the door and walk out. I'm taken back to the coldest three nights of my life. Just happened to be in Fort Jackson, South Carolina in November. I remember thinking I was going to freeze to death. I remember thinking that I was going to die, and I remember being very, very angry, being woke up, awakened, awakened, awakened up, whatever, for fire guard that particular outing, camping trip. And I remember thinking if I knew where I was, I would run to the closest building. You know... <clears throat> When I took my first pill of that antibiotic this last week, I, I don't know what it was, but somehow the sickness became bearable. And I felt like I was getting better. Now, don't accuse me of taking a placebo. I'll throw this thing out there. I, I mean, I tell you, when you know there's hope right on beyond the other side of what you're going through, things seem a little bit bearable, don't they? But think about being a tender plant growing up before the Father, and the only way out of it is to feel separated from your Father for the first time in eternity. How, Jesus? Jesus, how did you endure that for 33 years? To endure what was coming, how did you endure being a tender plant who little by little with every day that you grew up before the face of your father, you knew you were going to be crushed and bruised for the transgression of your people, you would be stricken. How horrible is our sin? Horrible enough for the Son of God to die for it. How petty are our offenses to one another? How petty indeed. For surely if I can be forgiven... And surely if it took the price of God crushing his tender plant, then surely I can forgive you. Look at verse 1. There are two interesting questions there, and then we're done. Who has believed our report? You know what you have to do today to be born again? You have to believe the report. That's it. John 3.16 is very clear. It's just as good as any other verse. That whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Nothing in there about a trip down the aisle or praying a sinner's prayer. Nothing in there at all. If that ruins your testimony, make the most of it. It's very clear. Isaiah 50 verse 1 says, O Lord, who has believed our report? This morning, have you believed the gospel that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures? You do not have to leave this room wondering if God is okay with you. Can I get an amen from any saints or does no one agree with me? The truth is if you believe the report, you are as good as saved. Put your faith in what Christ did for you on the cross and you are born again. You can know it. These things have I written on you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I am certain in a crowd this size, there's somebody that needs to just simply believe on what Christ did for them on the cross. And you're going to be tempted after you do that to say there must be something more. No, how can you do anything more than crush your own darling Son of God? Nothing more. 
The second question in verse 1 is, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We have shown you that the arm of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Has he been revealed to you today? Then you have much to be thankful for. Let's all stand together.